Today, I want to talk from the topic, she did that. And I'm going to use as a text, Judges, the fourth chapter, verses four through 10. But I'd encourage you to read all of the fourth chapter and even go over to the fifth chapter. But the section from verses four through 10 says, at that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lipidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. And she sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoah, from Kadesh and in Naphtali, and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel, command you, go take possession at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. You know, the other day I was having a conversation, texting actually with a friend of mine, and we ended up on the subject of being a woman, how much we appreciated being a woman. But we also discussed some of the challenges of being a woman, particularly some of the physiological challenges women have to face, even on a monthly basis. I think most women could join in that discussion, not as a pity party, but as a sorority of endurers of discomfort and expense. I remember one day going up to a cash register in a grocery store, and I had some items that I had to purchase on a monthly basis. And I said to the cashier with a completely straight face, I don't think I'm gonna do this anymore. It's too expensive. And she just laughed and laughed. It's something only women understand. She laughed and gave me an air high five because she understood what I was talking about. She had been in my shoes. She had been in the shoes of many women who go through the same thing. And when it comes to childbearing, I hear that although it's a painful experience, the result is usually worth the pain. But for some reason, there are still many women who want to have a stern word with Eve in the Bible. That's because they believe that explanation that women's physical pain is due to Eve's disobedience. Unfortunately, Eve and Mary are the women we hear of mentioned most in the Bible. Eve who caused trouble for women and Mary who was the mother of Jesus. But there are many others. There's Ruth and Naomi, there's Queen Vashti, there's Esther, there, there are female disciples like Tabitha, and there are many less known and many unnamed women in the Bible. Our text for today tells the story of one of those less known women who was actually very powerful. Her name was Deborah. The book of Judges is called the book of Judges because it includes the stories from the time between when Moses and Joshua led the Israelites and you know Moses led them out of Egypt and Joshua led them into the promised land. Judges tells the story of what happened in between that time, between that time and the time when kings began to rule. In that in-between time, as you can imagine, it was a very turbulent time. One of the com commentaries I read described the book of Judges this way. An exciting, colorful, disturbing book of the Bible with stories of political intrigue and assassination, lies and deception, rape and murder, courage and fear, great faith and idolatry, power and greed, sex and suicide, love and death, military victories and civil war. Sounds like some of the novels we read. But it was during this time, this, this time of turmoil, that Israel was ruled by a series of 12 judges. And judges, as we know it, are wise persons who arbitrate legal cases. And Deborah in our text was one of those. 
But the term judge in Hebrew also means rule or ruler. So these judges were warrior rulers who led Israel to fight oppressive enemies. And they also maintain Israel's religious life and institutions. The book itself was compiled over a few centuries beginning in the eighth century BCE until sometime after the exile of Judah to Babylon. So the audience for the final form of this book would have been the people of Judah who had experienced ex exile to Babylon and who had witnessed the disintegration of their social, political, and religious life. Judges highlights a repetitive cycle in the life of Israel, a cycle where Israel does evil, God sends an enemy. Israel cries in distress, distress, God sends a judge or a deliverer. Then Israel does evil again and the cycle repeats. Sounds like some of us today. You know how it is, we get stuck in a cycle, we'll try something that we know is good for us and then we fall off. And then we try it again and then we fall off. We don't stay up with the things that we know are good for us. Sometimes we change our diet. You know, sometimes we plan to get more rest. Sometimes we say today is the day I'm gonna start journaling. And then we do it for a little while. We know it's good for us, it feels right. And then it goes away. And then we start again. I don't know how many journals I have where I stopped and started and started again. I look at the dates. One day, it's like a year later for the next entry because I start what I think is good for me and then I skip it. That's how Israel was. They would do what was right for a period of time. And the next thing you know, they do something wrong again and they go into the same cycle. But in our text today, it highlights how women have the wisdom and the courage to do some amazing things. Because Deborah in our text was described as a prophetess. You know, I'm going to take a break there and let you know I'm going to refer to her as a prophet not a prophetess, because sometimes we use terms for women, different ones than we use for men, even though they're doing the same work. If Deborah got paid for being a prophetess, her pay would probably have been half of what a male prophet got paid. It reminds me how people call women pastors and preachers, Sister Martin, and call the men Reverend or Doc or Doctor when they haven't gone to one day of grad school. I used to say it didn't matter what people called me. I didn't care about titles, but it actually makes a difference. It's actually a sign of respect to use a person's title when they're operating in a capacity for which they have prepared themselves. Since I studied, went to class, wrote, earned a master of divinity, earned a doctor of ministry, went through the denominational committees. I don't mind reminding people when I'm working in a context of ministry, I don't mind reminding them, I am Reverend Dr. Kathy Martin Hunt. Unless I choose to be called Reverend Kathy or Dr. Kathy. The same is true for whatever profession or vocation we prepare ourselves for. I had to encourage Shauna to use Dr. Hunt the students needed to be calling her Dr. Hunt. She earned that. So back to Deborah. I'm going to refer to her as a prophet, not a prophetess. She was one who spoke a word from God to the people. She was also a judge. Most commentaries will say she was just a judge of arbitration, not military. But if you call up the leader of the army, as she did with Barack, and tell them that God said to go to war. And if that person says, I will go if you go with me, and if you tell that person I will go, that sounds like some military leadership in my book. So I'm not taking that away from them. The text says she did that. She went to war with them. You know, we always need to be mindful of who's telling our story. It's best if possible to tell and write our own story. That's why I encourage people to journal or write a memoir or just take some notes. You name who you are. You name what, you, what you've done and what you're able to do. Don't let anybody else label you. 
Deborah was a prophet. Deborah was a leader of the military and a judge. Deborah was on point with her prophecy. Barak was able to lead the army to victory, although the leader of the other army, Sisera, escaped but he didn't really get away. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the text says that Deborah said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you're going will not lead to your glory for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. But it wasn't her that she was talking about. If you read beyond the verses that I read for today, go down to around the 17th verse. You'll see where the text says Sisera went to the tent of a woman named Jael. And Jael knew what time it was. She knew what was going on. And so when Sisera went to her tent and asked to, uh, for her to hide him and to take care of him, she said, yes, come in. I offer you some milk, something to eat. You can lie down, you can rest. And so Sisera took her up on it. And he went in her house and he drank the milk. And the next thing you know, he fell asleep. Well, while he was sleeping, Jael took a tent peg and drove it into Sisera's temple and killed him. The text says she drove that, that peg so far it went into the ground on the other side. So the victory did not come by the hand of Barak, as Deborah said. It didn't even come from Deborah, but it came by the hand of Jael. She did that. You know, it's like when I watch basketball, I like women's college basketball. And, you know, you have your star players, but everybody can't be the MVP and can't be the highest scorer because we need to put our egos in check in, and be a team player if we really want to win the game. I mean, look at all the people that were involved in that victory. There was Deborah, there was Barack, and there was Jael. Sometimes we have to come together to make a difference. And sometimes we have to be willing to let another woman win. You know, the text reminds us of the diversity of women in our world. Some are well known like Deborah was in, in her day. People like we would look at Vice President Kamala Harris, or historically we look at Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, who was the first woman to receive a medal medical degree from an American medical school. Or we'll look at Mary Edwards Walker. She was the only woman in the US history to be awarded the Medal of Honor. It was funny. I read that they told her that she needed to stop wearing such manly clothes and start wearing more womanly clothes. There was Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected to the United States House of Representatives. And we forget, and she was also the first African-American to run, run for president. There was Sally Ride, the first American woman in space. And speaking of space, there was Mae Jemison. She was an engineer, a physician, and the first black woman to orbit the earth. There is Sister Rosetta Tharp, whose musical talent was a, played a huge role in the birth of rock and roll. She could play that guitar. You ought to look her up sometime and, and listen to how she played. She played gospel music, actually. There was Audre Lorde, whose writing on race, sexuality, and gender was way ahead of its time. But I also like this one, a, a woman, really a teenager, named Claudette Colvin, who refused to give up her seat on the bus nine months before Rosa Parks did. And then there are others who are less known with no title, people like Jael, people like my mom people like an old teacher or a minister or grandmother or some aunt or some woman who poured hope, encouragement into your life. Someone who spoke positively about you and over you. Someone who provided protection for you. They may not be well known, but they made a significant difference. I was reminded last night I was doing dishes or cooking or something and all of a sudden I started thinking about that song by Diane Reeves, Better Days. You can't th get through no better days to no better days unless you make it through the night. We all have had women in our lives who have helped us get through the night, helped us get through the dark times, have, have helped us get through when we didn't know which way to go. 
you know, this week we mark a very long, dark time that we've been going through. Our country, our world has been dealing with the impact of COVID-19 and it's made a huge impact on our lives and the livelihoods of women. Women are expected to be able to juggle more than men. Women are expected to be able to work, take care of the family, take care of the child care. And then during this year when schools were closed, they took on another hat and they had to be teachers. Women were juggling so much. And you know we'll never know the names of most of the women, but so many women made and are making a difference as they're trying to keep everything going. But it comes at a huge price to have that skill. Because during the pandemic, women have lost jobs at a rate of 1.8 times the rate of, of men. And women's participation in the labor force has dropped to a rate on par with 1988. It dropped now from 61% down to 57% as it was in 1988, per the National Women's Law Center. Approximately 40% of women over 20 have been without work for six months or longer during this pandemic. And of course, the unemployment rate for women is worse depending on race and ethnicity. We see that the rate for women, white women, was 5.1%. The unemployment rate for Asian women, 7.9%. For Black women, 8.5%. And Latinas, 8.8%. And that doesn't even include all of the women who had to make a choice between caring for the children at home because the children are out of school because of COVID-19. Prior to the pandemic, 41% of women were the breadwinners in their family. So the financial impact of all this job loss is devastating. When you look at all that women are juggling and look at all that women have lost and still trying to keep things looking good in the family, trying to keep the family fed and kind of trying to keep the family whole, it comes at a devastating cost because it's causing a crisis in women's mental health. Our text helps highlight the power of women. And yes, women are powerful, but that power comes at a cost. Time Magazine highlighted that while one in three white women report having experienced domestic violence during the pandemic, the rate of abuse increased dramatically to about 50% and higher for those marginalized by race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, citizenship status, and cognitive or physical ability. And according to the Human Rights Campaign, transgender and gender nonconforming people face a heightened risk of fatal violence and black transgender women are especially vulnerable because of the toxic mix of transphobia, racism, and misogyny. You know, the best we can do for ourselves and for all women in our lives and all women in our community is treat women with the love and respect we all deserve and demand that everyone else does the same from our government all the way down to the kid on the street. And not just in this country, we see women on the front line in places like Miramar and in, in India, you know, women are protesting because of the farms in India. Women are on the front line. No matter what age, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or citizenship, or ability, uh, level of ability, all women are deserving of respect in the home, in society, in the workplace, in the church, in government, wherever we may be. And that goes even for those of us who are women. We need to learn how to respect and honor ourselves and accept nothing less from everyone else and expect nothing less for everyone else. Laverne Cox put it this way, each and every one of us has the capacity to be an oppressor. I want to encourage each and every one of us to interrogate how we might be an oppressor and how we might be able to become liberators 
for ourselves and for each other. And you know, you don't have to be a woman to celebrate respect and stand for women. You know, this is a time to give thanks for all of the women who have positively impacted our lives. If they're still living, perhaps we can get in touch with them and give them a specific thank you, not a general thank you, but a specific thank you. If this is what you did that helped save my life, or this is what you did that got me on the right track, or this is what you did that helped me make it through my dark night. She did that. Have a virtual gathering with some women in your life and offer some support and encouragement to one another. Bring some women together and brainstorm ways how we can lighten the load for women in our communities and in our world. We don't have to be as bold as Deborah or Jael, we, but we all have our gifts that we can bring to the mix. Felicia Rashad put it this way, Anytime women come together with collective intention, it's a powerful thing. Whether it's sitting down making a quilt, in a kitchen preparing a meal, in a club reading the same book, or around the table playing cards, or play, planning a birthday party. When women come together with a collective intention, magic happens. Thank God for the women who have positively impacted our lives, our communities, and our world. Let us commit to doing the best we can do out of love and respect for all women. Thank you for listening.